It's uh, my great honor and privilege to get to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Uh, Joel Funk. Uh, got his Bachelor's of Arts degree in Agriculture uh, from Tabor University in 1982, and then he followed that uh, with his Master's of Science degree in Entomology <coughs> from Kansas State University. He finished his PhD in Biology also at Kansas State uh, in 1992. Uh, he did some postdoctoral post work uh, in microbiology at, at Oregon State University until 1998 uh, and then uh, went on to become a research entomologist. And if you don't know what entomology is, that's study of insects. So he was a research entomologist uh, for the USDA in Arizona for a few, uh, for a few years and then uh, followed that up by becoming a research and developmental scientist at the uh, cytoskeleton. Uh, incorporated in Denver, Colorado, and then moved from there to becoming a, an instructor of medicine at the National Jewish Medical and Research Center, also in Denver. And that's where we found him in 2009. He was doing that, and we said, Let us take you away from all of this and come to Asylum Springs, Arkansas. And he said, I would love to. And so uh, Dr. Funk became one of our uh, great colleagues and one of our uh, great biology faculty members uh, and starting in the year 2009 uh, until uh, the present time. Dr. Funk teaches microbiology and fundamentals of microbiology, for our, which was a course that was started for our new nursing program. He also teaches, uh, has taught biological science. He currently teaches plant biology and plant animal diversity along with myself, uh, plant physiology, uh, virology and uh, a smattering of other things but we are so honored and so thankful to the Lord that uh, Dr. Funk is uh, one of our colleagues here and as uh, he begins to come up I'm going to pray for us and then let him uh, start his program. Lord Jesus we just thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to hear Dr. Funk as he uh, is going to uh, reveal to us uh, some of the wonderful things and the wonders of the world that you've made, things that are so small that, uh, that we can't see them uh, with the, the naked eye. And uh, we have to use some technology to see it. And, uh, and I'm just so thankful uh, that he's here to do that, that uh, he is a good colleague and a good friend. And so we just uh, give you praise and glory uh, for his life and for what he's going to present to us tonight. And just pray that you would bless him in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to start off with a verse here from Psalms. So David, as he looked into the starry sky, he said, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And he was looking off into the distant sky and seeing all these tiny stars out there. He had no way to know that there was much beyond what he could see. And today with the Hubble telescope, we can see much, much further than that. Uh, in the same way, we can see things that David had no idea existed. So, as he was pointing at the stars, he had no idea that his hands had additional organisms on them, or that his gut had organisms in them. It's a hidden world, uh, but that has been revealed, and it's a privilege of us as scientists, or students of scientists, or students of science, or people who are interested in science in general, to understand just a little bit more about what God created, and hopefully, how he created and some of how that works. So I have a bit of a change of that verse. My version says, the heavens and cells and molecules declare the glory of God. The skies and with microscopes, we can proclaim the work of his hands as we peer into the hidden world. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about uh, this evening and specifically about the microbiome. So I'm so excited. So many of you are interested in the microbiome and microbiology, or maybe you had someone sitting to be here uh, this is uh, the ring nebula on the left-hand side. It turns out on the right-hand side, it may have some semblance, similarity there, but it's actually a microbe. It's Staphylococcus aureus. Um, for microbiology, we actually have to stain things. It's not naturally that color, but we can visualize various aspects by adding dyes to it. That's what the case was on the right-hand side. So when I talk about the microbiome, I can only cover a few things. It's actually an area that has had a tremendous amount of research over the last few years, especially the last five years, but the last few decades, uh, just a, a huge increase. And I can cover just a bare, um, you know, a 
very tiny portion of that, I guess I should say. Uh, but what I'm going to do is talk about what it is and where it is, how it's studied to some degree, and then also what good it does. So there's some aspects that affect human health, and I think perhaps some of you are interested in that as well. So I'm going to touch on that as well. So, uh, but it's only a smattering of what is out there. In fact, I had a hard time kind of condensing it. Even this morning, I had probably 60 slides, and I was trying to just get it down to something that was manageable. So before I start, I have a few disclaimers. So if you're uh, what we call a germaphobe, this probably isn't a good talk for you. But maybe it helps to know that microbes are so numerous in so many different places. Um, my talk is not intended to give advice for, in, in a way of health, health advice for individuals. You know, always consult your primary care physician. I'm not going to go into the health aspects too much, but we're going to touch on that a little bit. And I think the last thing is don't believe everything you read on the internet. There's a lot of hype when it comes to the microbiome and probiotics and that sort of thing. So uh, we as scientists have to kind of sort out all that out as, you know, as professors, but also you as consumers of science in the, in the public, uh, in the newspaper. It's sometimes hard to figure that out. So hopefully you can touch on that a little bit. So we see all kinds of things like this. This is actually a YouTube video. Uh, Dr. Pedre probably does a great job. His new book is Happy Gut, uh, but he has a video about how pets and meditation improve your gut health. So that may very well be, but uh, take everything with a grain of salt, of course, and try to get the best information you can. So we're going to start off with what is the microbiome? Well, it is basically make, made up of microbes. So what kind of microbes are we talking about? When you think about microbes, it's really anything that you can't see by the naked eye. You have to have some way of an aid to see that. So basically, you need a microscope of some sort to visualize it, and it can be bacteria. We're going to spend most of our time actually thinking about talking about bacteria, but it's also fungi, viruses, protozoa, archaea, a number of different types of categories of microbes. So when we talk about the microbiome, we're talking about the microbes in a defined area, so a defined space. And you have to have some way to detect that. So obviously we can't see with the naked eye, so you have to be able to detect that in other ways. Uh, related to that, and a term that comes up oftentimes is the term metagenome, um, and metagenomics, and that essentially is uh, detecting the microbiome. In this case, we're looking at specifically microbes, uh, but it's the genes that are associated with that microbiome. And so it's the collection of all the microbial genes in a particular environment. And so that's kind of one way that this is studied uh, to determine who's there in that environment. So it's not just human microbiome. We're going to spend most of our time talking about that. But people are studying the microbiome in all kinds of defined space. Um, there is a project going on currently. And there's a paper that came out within the last few weeks. Kind of uh, analyzing and, and describing another step of that. It's called the Earth Microbiome Project, and their goal is to figure out all the micro, microbes everywhere on Earth. So, pretty daunting task. Uh, one of their quotes uh, in this last publication, last couple weeks, is they were analyzing bacteria from permafrost, Komodo dragons, and coral reefs, and everything in between. So, that is going on at the same time. Uh, but we're going to mainly focus on the human microbiome. So, when we think of humans, it's good to get a perspective of how many uh, microbes are out there. And in relation to human cells, how many microbes are out there? There's a statistics that's been quoted quite a bit over the last decade that I've looked at this. I mean, when, since I've been teaching microbiology more specifically. And usually you hear this quoted that there are 10 times more non-human cells than human cells. So 10 times more microbes than human cells in and on your body. Well, it turns out that's not quite right. And so in the last couple of years, uh, they've readjusted that to maybe three to one. And more recently, I just saw part of the video in the last few days where this may be just slightly more. Uh, so the estimate by one researcher in the field said there are 39 trillion microbial cells in or on you, and there are about 30 trillion human cells. It's hard to fathom what that is like. I mean, I can't even imagine what you know, that number is like, really. Honestly, but uh, it's a tremendous amount, and never you measure there are more microbial cells in or on you than there are of your own cells. My response to that is well, wait a minute, those microbial cells are really small, so does it make that much difference? Uh, it can, so we're going to look at that. 
Uh, but before we go into that, we also, I want to just mention that there are other microbes, of course, again, but uh, when it comes to viruses, there are more viruses than bacteria, in fact. So uh, for every microbial cell, there are probably five virus particles in your system. Uh, when it comes to fungi, they're probably less, so about tenfold less than bacteria. So that kind of gives you a perspective of some of the numbers. When we're thinking about microbes on your own human body, uh, that hopefully will get it down to an estimate we can kind of, you know, fathom a little bit better when it comes to species specifically. So when it comes to species, there are probably about a thousand or so species in your gut, not necessarily all at the same time, but at, over a period of time, there will be something in that range. In some cases, there could be more than that. Uh, when we think of all the species in all of our guts together, of course, you don't want to think about that too much, but there are perhaps up to 5,000 different species that are represented in different people's guts in different populations. Uh, that's not the only place where microbes are found. Of course, they're found all over the body, and so there could be up to 10,000 different species in or on your body at any one time. Um, it was just a few years ago when it was estimated there may be 100,000 micro, uh, microbes, different species of bacteria specifically, uh, maybe more than that, but a recent estimate, this is in 2016, that now that we know based on some of this analysis, they are now estimating there could be actually one trillion different species of microbes on planet Earth, and that, again, that's hard to fathom, but that's a projection based on modeling systems that they have established. So there's no shortage of work if you're a microbiologist for eons to come. So when we think of microbes, I said, you know, there may be, it used to be, we think, 10 times many more microbes than human cells, but now that number has come down, but does that make a difference because they're so small? Well, it turns out, because we have so many different species, if you gather up all the different genes that would be contained in those cells, it's actually a amounts to a whole host of much, much more than there are human cells. So in our human body, we have about 20,000 genes in our human body that are, can be expressed at various times. In a single person, there are probably 8 million microbial genes. So yes, it can have an effect because of this power of genetics. If those genes are expressed in a certain way, it obviously could have a very powerful impact on our health and on our well-being as well. So about, uh, the estimate is 300 times more genes, microbial genes, enter on your body than your own cells would have, the number of genes your own cells would have. Uh, the numbers are, of course, different with virus, uh, with other types of microbial cells, and it depends on what kind you talk about. Uh, but again, that gives you kind of perspective, the influence that these uh, cells could have on the body. So one question you might have is, can I get my microbiome analyzed? I know everybody's wondering that probably right at this point. Well, it, it turns out, yes, you can. For $99, you can get analyzed, okay? So you just have to send a sample. Uh, actually, they don't care what kind of sample you send. You can send a poop sample, you can send a skin sample, you can send whatever sample you want. And these scientists in San Diego will analyze your microbiome of that part of your body. Uh, it's actually a citizen science project, so they will analyze it, and if you send in your sample, it might look like this. This is my attempt at potty humor, okay, there's a stool inside there. Um, uh, you'll get a report back like this. So Michael Pollan is actually a science, a science journalist, and so he allowed his uh, microbiome to be published. You can compare your microbiome with other people, the most prevalent microbes, how it differs than people in Venezuela and Malawi, how it differs according to different body sites, and that sort of thing. So uh, actually, this is similar to Ancestry.com, but it's your microbe that you can have analyzed, microbiome specifically. I want to touch on two other types of microbes besides bacteria, because we're going to spend most of our time on bacteria. But when it comes to the biomes, that would be all the viruses in or on your body, uh, it is quite diverse as well. It turns out that most of the viruses in or on the body are actually bacteria phages. So that's viruses that infect the bacteria. And so there's this back and forth war going on between these microbial, ce microbial cells. Viruses infecting and killing bacterial cells and then reinfecting other ones. Uh, that happens in your gut all the time as well as on your skin, your mouth, other places. So most of the virus, when I say there are a lot of all these viruses, most of the virus is actually attacking the bacteria but it lives uh, in this back and forth type environment. 
and it doesn't kill all your bacteria, although uh, we probably know it if it happened because of the effect. But there are other viruses in and around our body that do have an effect to some degree. If you've had any type of herpes virus, if you ever had a cold sore, if you ever had chicken pox, you have that virus for life and it's living inside, somewhere inside your body. Other types of viruses that can occur at different times are a wide variety. These polymoviruses typically infect skeletal uh, cells in your skin. The largest proportion here is a group that we have really not very much information about. They're little tiny viruses that inhabit all of our bodies. Uh, you've probably never heard of them before. Anelloviridae is the family name, but the, the kind of representation of that are these torquinoviruses. And we really don't have, know what the impact is. So they're being sh produced and shed in our body all the time. Uh, at the present time, they say there's no clearly associated clinical manifestation of this, all this virus that's being produced. So uh, it's still a mystery what's going on there, but um, it was only identified about 20 years ago. Nobody knew about this virus until about 20 years ago. So it's going to be an area of ongoing investigation. And when it comes to fungi, again, a, a broad spectrum of different fungi. The ones that are probably most represented is Aspergillus and Canada, found in different parts of our body. Uh, again, sometimes they cause health problems, sometimes they don't, but they also could have a positive impact. impact. So especially some of the yeast species that live inside our gut could have a positive impact, impact on our health. So um, the bottom line uh, at this point is the human body hosts a huge number of microbes of many different kinds. And I have some red letters under there that aren't showing up very well, but just to reiterate, there are bacteria, vir uh, fungi, viruses, and other categories like archaea and protista. So there's abundant diversity. And actually, they tend to keep each other in check most of the time. So even though we have a thousand species in our gut, there is a back and forth, but it's kind of a settled community uh, most of the time that kind of keeps things in balance. And we'll come back to that point later on. So where is the normal microbiome in a human body? We've already talked about the gut and the skin, so it's there. So really, any exposed surface in our body, so skin, mouth, gut, ears, belly button, between your toes, anywhere you can think of, you have microbes there. And in fact, you know, you wash your hands, that's a great idea, but even though you wash multiple times, I can guarantee you there's still microbes there. You can't get rid of them totally, completely. What's been interesting, one of the in most interesting um, um, developments in the last few years is that they're finding their microbes in places that we used to think were completely sterile in our body. So some of those are listed here, and there are other parts of our body, but these are some of the areas we thought we used to be sterile, or we used to think they were sterile. They, we just didn't know. So that would include the bladder and urine. We thought that was sterile, but in just in the past few years, we found out that there are actually microbes. There's a natural microbiome. Probably not a lot of species there. They're probably protecting those parts of your body from infections from other species that could invade those areas. So lung, eye, milk, reproductive tract, the female reproductive tract. There are a few of these that have been identified and published in the literature that they do have a micro, normal, natural microbiome. But I put an asterisk beside them because they're still a bit controversial if there's a normal microbiome there. So that's the preborn infant, amniotic fluid and placenta, and actually the brain. So there have been some studies that show that there may be a normal microbiome in the brain, that sounds kind of scary, but uh, we'll see if that turns out or not. So there's a lot of controversy with that. The controversy with amniotic fluid and placenta uh, is partly, I think, based on the fact that uh, early on, actually not early on, just in the last few years, these studies were done and they did identify some microbes that uh, were present there, uh, sometimes in meconium. Um, you know, the first baby poop basically has some microbes in the system sometimes, but not always. So what they found, and actually a fairly recent review in the last few months said that, yeah, sometimes there is, but about 60 to 70 percent of the time there are no microbes there. So I think late during the, the cycle before a baby is born, there's probably some breach sometimes for some uh, developing babies, but not for others. In most cases, this, again, doesn't lead to disease or problems, but uh, still trying to figure out what the case is there. So uh, these studies that are done, oftentimes they take samples all over your body. In this case, it was just a skin study. But it turns out that each one of these sites in your body hosts, hosts a different type of microbiome. 
And the color designation here has to do with families of bacteria or phyla bacteria. And you can see there's a big difference just by the color designation on oily, oily parts of our body. So like for instance on our back versus dry parts versus moist parts. They all host a distinct type of community there. There will be some overlap, but there are very distinct uh, communities of bacteria in those regions. So it's been interesting to discover this as well, how unique each part of our body is. So is everybody's microbiome the same? Uh, that's a good question, and the answer is no. We each have a unique microbiome. Um, and there's actually a large variation between individuals. So if we focus in on the gut, where most of our microbiome is in terms of mass, uh, there's a lot of variation. If you compare me to any one of you, we'd have a different set of residents there that live there. But it seems to be a fairly stable community. So if you test my microbiome and then test it again a month, a year, five years later, there seems to be some stability there. It's not constantly changing unless there's an illness or something else going on. The body sites seem to be more specialized, and so just as I showed with the uh, skin microbiome, each one of those sites tends to be different. So what is kind of, a, kind of a subtle way in which one way to look at this is before they knew exactly what the components were, they thought that there would be a core uh, group of microbes that are found kind of in everybody's gut, and there are a few of those, but it turns out we each have more unique microbes but there is a functional core. So that means what they're doing has to have kind of the same biochemical um, pathways that they're covering. So they functionally has to be a similar core in order to be effective. But the individual species tend to vary quite a bit between individuals. So that has to do with how we digest food, specifically when we're thinking about the gut. So the ability to digest certain high carbohydrates or certain proteins or synthesize vitamins break down toxins, all those things can be done by a variety of different microbes, bacteria specifically, so it's not going to always be the same population. It can be done by a, a different types of communities when you compare individuals. individuals. So here's one uh, example of that. So this is an earlier study, only three individuals, and between the three individuals, they found that there are 100, uh, 818 uh, bacterial species that they could detect. But between those, only half of those were found in common, so about half. So 387 were found in common between all those individuals. So it, it turns out about half of those microbes were unique to at least one person, in some cases uh, two people and not the other person. So that just gives you an idea of how one person is unique compared to another, but really probably still having that functional core that has to be maintained in order to do the same type of activity within that zone. So how do you study the microbiome? Well, since the microbe, the microscope is a useful tool, um, there's a downside to use a microscope because you can't tell if those microbes are dead or alive. They could just be passengers going through. It's hard to know. But that is one tool that's used. You can also grow microbes. Uh, the downside of that is a lot of microbes you can't grow on a petri dish. So there's an idea in microbiology, my, microbiology that's called the great plate anomaly. So most of you have seen a petri dish before, or a petri plate. If you would take a sample from my mouth or another part of my body and grow it on a petri dish, you get a few things to grow, but the estimate is you can only get about 1% of those microbes to grow. So that's kind of a downside to trying to grow microbes and figure out what's there. The technique that's used now, and really is the revolution in order, in order to understand the microbiome, is sequencing. So sequencing has been done, sequencing DNA specifically, the genes. So that's been done for a few decades. There are various tools that are used for that. But what has really been the revolution here is it's getting much cheaper and cheaper to do that. So next generation sequencing, that's this abbreviation here, has driven down the cost tremendously and so now we can sequence everything everywhere, basically. You just have to provide the sample, and it's much more um, you know, cost-effective to do that. And that's been the approach. We did, again, have a downside here, as if you're sequencing everything, you have no idea if it's alive or dead, if it's just a, you know, a temporary resident or not. So really, in practice, all of these together combine and what has ways to study it. But really, what's driving this revolution in understanding the microbiome is the sequencing. Uh, technology 
technology that's available. There are other ways to study these. We can study specifically the proteins or carbohydrates or the metabolic processes as well. And those efforts are going on as well. But it's really the sequencing that is the core of our revolution that we have right now. So one of the questions you might have is, how do you get your microbiome? It's, uh, I suppose you can think of it as an accident. And nobody does it intentionally. But really, the answer initially is from your mother. So as you're born, you obtain the beginning of your microbiome. But past that point, as you develop, and your microbiome does change over a period of time as you develop, it's really your environment. So uh, from other humans, it's been estimated that if you kiss somebody, you transfer 80 million bacteria in a kiss, OK? That gives you an idea of how small bacteria are. I hear a few groans there, but that's the statistic. It's been published in, in scientific journals. Uh, obviously, you can also get it from animals and food and other places in the environment as well. But uh, it's, it starts with your mother. That is different for different individuals, depending on whether you were born uh, naturally through the vaginal canal or if you were born in a C-section. And that's been an area of great interest recently, just trying to figure out what the difference is. So initially, we're colonized by a microbiota that comes from our mother, especially the natural childbirth, the C-section that microbiome develops differently. And that's been actually an area of interest because uh, there are differences, whether you're born by C-section or uh, through natural childbirth, as far as uh, some of the health situations you can encounter in life. So one of the approaches people have taken recently is if you're going to have a C-section, or the mother's going to have a C-section, is to take a vaginal swab and smear that over the baby just so they can get the natural microbiome. Um, like much of microbiome research, most of this has not been tested in you know, long-term studies as far as control groups and that sort of thing. And so there is still some question as far as if, if this is the most effective way to do that. And I actually, this afternoon, when I was still looking at some different research, I came across this statement that was published this month by the Committee on Obstetric Practice. So the College of Obstetrics and Gynecology published this month, and they said it actually gives you an insight into what the possibility is for a microbiome as well. So I'm just going to read that. It says, as the increase in the frequency of asthma, atopic disease, and immune disorder mirrors the increase in the rate of cesarean delivery, the theory of vaginal seeding is to allow for proper colonization of fetal gut and therefore reduce the subsequent risk. Uh, of all those diseases they mentioned there. There are three or four different diseases they mentioned. At this time, though, they said vaginal seeding should not be performed outside the context of an institutional review board approved research protocol until adequate data regarding the safety and benefit of the processes has become available. So really, we're at a point in time in understanding the science is we think it's very beneficial to do this. But we haven't done enough controlled studies to really know if it has a positive impact that we want it to have. And that's true of much of microbiome research and probiotics. We have an idea that probably works and works well, but the studies uh, are not very subtle at this point. And that's the process of science, really. We're just kind of in the middle of that understanding, and it can be messy sometimes. They're not clear answers all the time. So as babies develop, we start out with a microbiome that's derived from the mother or from other sources. If depending on how they're born. Uh, that micro microbiome develops in different ways, depending on whether the baby is breastfed or formula fed. Uh, as they develop and start uh, eating <coughs> solid food, what you see here, and it may be difficult to see, but again, the color combination here is indicating the types of microbes, the phyla, that are shifting as that development stage, as those development stages take place. So your microbiome is actually changing through, especially those early years into adolescence, but by the time you become an adult, it's more subtle, and it tends to stay that way for much of your adult life. Any time along this process, you can have perturbation. You can have things that change your microbiome, such as malnutrition, such as antibiotic treatment. And this one, of course, is huge. So we do take antibiotics for specific reasons, for illnesses caused by microbes. But you just have to realize it's going to have perhaps a profound effect on your microbiome in your gut and perhaps other places as well. So different changes can take place. And actually, there are differences in 
uh, people as they develop as well. So a obese person has a different microbiome than a healthy person. And then as you age, that can change as well. So you have changes, especially in older years as well. And that, again, is an interplay that takes place between your body and the microbiome. And that especially takes place in our gut, but it also takes place in other parts of our body. So it's not just the micro, microbiome, it's also our body interacting with it that allows that microbiome to live and thrive there. So is the microbiome good or bad? Well, it all depends, of course. So um, there are the good guys, the bad guys, and the category I'm going to call it depends. And I actually brought a few of my friends here. I have a good guy and I have a bad guy. Uh, Microbiologists are not the geek, but they have their own company called Giant Microbes, I believe it is. And you can buy your favorite microbes. I have a bad guy and a good guy here today. Um, this one is a little weird. He has kind of a big head. My wife thought it was a baby shaker or something, but it's actually a specific microbe. Uh, so we're going to talk about these a little bit. So the bad first. If you have bad microbes, and especially if you have a microbiome, so the collection of all the microbes, it leads to a um, state that's called dysbiosis. So things aren't quite right in your microbiome. And we're going to mainly focus on the gut because that's where we best understand that. So a variety of things can happen. Obviously, um, you can have diarrhea. That would be a common effect of really messed up microbiome. You can have other types of infections that can spread to other parts of your body. You can have inflammation that leads to inflammatory bowel syndrome. Uh, there are actually examples where we think that um, bacteria in your gut can lead to other uh, diseases, including cancer. So gastric cancer and lymphoma, there is some evidence that helicobacter species can lead to gastric cancer and colon cancer. As there again, there's some evidence that a certain species of bacteria, use of bacteria, can lead to colon cancer. So those are serious conditions. Um, so we know there's some really bad bacteria, and we're going to look at that a little bit. But before I talk about that, I want to talk about the ecology of the human body. So when you talk about ecology, you're usually talking about the environment we live in. But the human body itself can be thought of as an ecosystem. And the way we study ecology, there are a variety of ways you can do that. But kind of the three main ways we do that is to look at populations. And there are population ecologists that specialize in that. You can look at communities and you can look at ecosystems. And really, I think the best paradigm to look at the microbiome is to think about uh, our body as a community, specifically a microbial community, but also interacting with our own human body. One aspect I want to touch on right now is the way that those individuals, those actually the populations within that community, interact with each other. So there are three. There are more than that, but three main ways in which uh, individuals and populations can interact. If they're helping each other, that's called mutualism. In some cases, there's one organism or set of organisms that benefits, but the other one really has no effect. In the uh, environment we live in, an example would be that would be similar to like moss growing in a tree. The moss has an advantage. It has a place to live. It really has no effect on the tree. So that would be an example of that happening. Um, and then we have the bad actors, so we have parasitism. And actually, when we talk about microbes, we usually refer to those as pathogens. So microscopic parasite would be a pathogen. So we have examples of each one of these when we talk about microbes. And really, uh, the focus is the good guys are the mutualists, the bad guys are pathogens or parasites, and the depends, I'm going to kind of put in that category. It turns out both in you know, larger animals, but also microbes, Sometimes these organisms shift from one to the other. And I just have the direction of these arrows going one way, but it actually can shift in either way. So a commensal organism can become more mutualistic in some cases, or it can become pathogenic in some cases when it comes to microbes. So some of these conditions are uh, conditional. So uh, when we're thinking about good or bad, uh, we might think of it in terms of health as well. And one of the aspects that I spent some time reading about because I teach microbiology, but again, there's a ton of literature there that I'm sure I've not read. You can do searches on the scientific literature of microbiome and, and you can come up with basically an answer to any health problem that you have. So microbiome and whatever, there's probably somebody that's looked at it. Uh, we do know there are some very positive aspects, and that is 
uh, within our gut specifically. So we're going to focus on the gut. Mainly it's in the large intestines. So there are some microbes in the small intestine, but the population is not as great. But we do, those, do, do know that those microbes can be involved in fermentation. So really breaking down products that we eat that help uh, provide those for our own body. Um, part of that is forming short chain fatty acids. Those are important uh, energy sources for our own diet, so forming acetate, propionate, and curate. Those are all sources of energy that our bodies can use. Uh, another example is the production of vitamins. So specific microbes can produce vitamins that we can use. The other thing that the microbiome does that's good, specifically impacting our health, is they can train our immune system. And specifically in gut, but it can be in other places as well. So train it to realize what is you and what's not you, what's self, what's not self. So hopefully they develop a tolerance to the food you eat. Sometimes that's not the case if you're allergic to certain foods, but that hopefully is the case for most individuals. Uh, they can also differentiate that in this training process, your immune system attacks the bad bacteria and not the good bacteria. So there are immune cells in our, in our gut system that can be involved in that as well. And then of course we come to the place where Hopefully, there's some prevention as well. So if you have a good microbiome, you can prevent disease, keep disease from happening, and if there is disease, you can help treat that. And again, there are multiple areas in which this impacts. And I put down a few of these that have been receiving attention recently, some that you would not expect to have an impact, but they include multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, we've already mentioned some of those. But again, fill in that blank, you can find literature where people have try to understand, and there are some, in some cases, <coughs> evidence that there may be an, have an impact there. There's one aspect of this interaction that I didn't really feel like I had a lot of time to get into, so I'm going to play a short video clip that explains this about three minutes, and that's the interaction between the gut and the brain. The gut is down here, the brain's up here, you think there's no, you know, kind of transfer over, but in fact there is uh, some interesting connections that I think uh, scientists are beginning to understand. So hopefully this works. If I pop this other screen up, I may have to have a little help here. But. So it's kind of the middle of a explanation. I'm going to do one segment, but it's going to describe some of this interaction that involves our brain. So the microbes in our gut um, interacting with our brain. Evidence has emerged that the influence of our gut microbiome goes much I might have to have another way to display that. I'm going to get some tech help here. So it's playing on my screen, but not on the big screen. Is there another way to show that? OK. <laughs> it's not listed. Ah, there it is. OK. It might even talk directly to our brain. We've observed a few curious things. 90% of our body's serotonin, an important messenger substance for nerve cells, is produced in the gut. Some scientists think the microbiome does this to communicate with the vagus nerve, the information highway of our nervous system. Other examples are bacteria that stimulate immune cells in the gut, so they send a kind of alarm signal to the brain. Here, it activates immune cells that help the brain recover from injuries. Since the brain decides when we eat, the microbiome is interested in a healthy brain. A new field of science is opening up here, and we're just on the verge of understanding how these complex systems inside our bodies interact. But we are starting to see how much our microbiome actually influences us and our behavior. Take depression, for example. Healthy rats fed microbes from the guts of depressed people began showing anxiety-like behavior and symptoms that looked like depression. And in early 2017, a study took the microbiome to intelligence by connecting a certain setup of bacteria in newborns with better motor and language skills. But it might also influence our daily lives. Tests with fruit flies showed that their microbiome influenced what kinds of food they craved. This could mean your microbes are able to tell your brain which food it should get them, although this is not a one-way street. The seed for our microbiome comes from our mother, but how it develops and changes is determined by what we eat. 
The organisms in our gut feed on different things. Some like fibers and leafy greens, others go for sugars and starches, and some love greasy fries and butter. Our gut is like a garden in which we constantly decide what will grow and blossom. If we eat healthily, we breed bacteria that like healthy food. If we eat a lot of fast food, then we breed fast food loving bacteria. Life is hard, so we can get trapped in a vicious circle. You have a stressful time and eat lots of burgers and fries and pizza. This is awesome for fast food bacteria. They multiply and multiply and take up space from vegetable loving bacteria. But even worse, they send signals to the brain. Developed uh, for germ free mice. Basically, they can take uh, mice by C section, keep them sterile and then infect them basically with microbiomes from people. And that's one way to study that interaction. So in one situation with, when that's done, uh, these germ-free mice were uh, basically transplanted with microbiome from an obese person. Those mice became obese. A germ-free mouse in which she transplanted microbiome from lean people, a lean person, that mouse was lean. And when they co-housed them, interestingly enough, um, that blocked the body fat increase in the obese mouse, and partly that was because of the interaction between the two. So there was a transfer of the microbiome from the lean mouse to the obese mouse. Again, it's hard to fathom that that would be the case, but they've done this in a number of different studies, and it seems to have an impact. How you derive those mouse mice are pretty interesting. This is from NIH, and really, I mean, it takes a lot of work to this point and to maintain those colonies, but I think a lesson from that is one of the quotes here I have at the bottom is interesting uh, implication. It says that mice that are raised germ-free without any microbiome have altered immune systems, they have altered hearts, lungs, lymph nodes, metabolism, and even reproductive ability. So if you didn't believe that microbiome has an impact, the impact that you can see on these mouse mouth system is huge. And you can see uh, in the absence of microbiome, our bodies would be a lot different and respond differently to a lot of different things. So here's the bad guy I want to focus on for just a minute, and that's Clostridium difficile. So Clostridium difficile, which is this guy, he's really knobby on top because he actually has a spore inside on this end. And the spore is important because uh, this guy can survive when there are harsh antibiotics that come through a gut system. So the microbe itself dies, but there are spores there that can re-germinate once, once the antibiotic is gone. And so what happens is, in our gut, we have hopefully a good immune system and we have a good microbiota. If we uh, take antibiotics, that's one way you can perturb the microbiome. It can wipe out all the good microbes, or a large portion of those. And that's when this guy can come along and take over because there's extra space and there's extra nutrients. So what happens then is it can wreak havoc, basically. So, uh, producing toxins, it's a little bit hard to see probably, but they're toxins produced by C. difficile, uh, commonly called C. diff. Uh, and what happens is in the process uh, causing very, very severe diarrhea. So this is a huge problem in certain populations, especially elderly populations. So this is a graphic from the CDC in the United States. There are about 500,000, half a million cases per year. It especially hits the elderly, so 65 and older. Um, the rate of death is much higher. There are about 15,000 people a year in the United States that die from this. Uh, so it's a huge problem, and it's actually caused oftentimes by taking antibiotics. So how do you treat people that are suffering from, from a microbe caused by antibiotics? Well, the common way to treat that is by giving them antibiotics. And hopefully they're specific enough that it's going to kill this one bad bacteria this time and not uh, kill the good bacteria that may be still in a residual state there. Um, this type of treatment was not, has not been great, and what happens oftentimes is these individuals, you have a relapse, a recurrence, and kind of a vicious cycle. So within the last 10 years, and this is kind of experimental in different places around the United States and actually Australia, they finally tried a method that is, uh, has been obscure, but you probably read about it in the newspaper. It's called fecal microbial transplant. So what they do is they take the microbiome from one individual, oftentimes somebody in their own family or household, transplant that into the person who is suffering from C. diff, and it's been very successful in treating these individuals. So not just a single 
bacteria to replace that. I mean, that's the type of thing we'd like to do with probiotics. But in this case, an entire microbiome from one person into another person. So this has been, again, very successful for treating. Their, the success rate is, is very high percent, 89% success rate, whereas with retreating the antibiotics usually took many tries and oftentimes was not as successful. So lucky you, if you are, I always tell people in my microbiology class, if you're a college student and would like to earn some extra money, this is your chance, okay? This is called Open Microbiome, or Open Myofiome Project. You can save lives, earn money, donate your school, just go to giveproof.com.org. Uh, the caveat is you have to live in a place where you can get this donation. Uh, you get $40 per donation. You can do that several times a week over a six to eight week period. And, um, you, you have to live in Boston, though, unfortunately, to make this donation. Okay, so that's a bad guy and one way to treat it. Uh, there's lots of bacteria that are kind of in between. So this is an in between depends category. We call these opportunistic pathogens. It could be some that you're very familiar with, so E. coli or yeast, Acrococcus, all of those sometimes are just resident in it, they don't cause any problem. In fact, C. diff we just talked about, it's oftentimes in our gut that doesn't do anything bad. So it depends on other things. So for instance, if you have a disturbed microbiome, that would include if you're taking antibiotics or other things. What I want to talk about next is one of the good guys. This is lactobacillus, and actually this is represents many different species. There are estimated there are 200 different species of lactobacillus. Um, the one that's common if you read your yogurt container is acidophilus in the species, but uh, it's thought that of those 200, about 50 of those have been re are common residents, so they've been repeatedly isolated from stool species of healthy uh, individuals. Um, what do they do? Well, they do a number of things. So just like other microbes, they can inhibit the growth of pathogens, keep them out of the way. Uh, they are involved in food fermentation, so they provide food for us. It's not just for humans. They're actually uh, studies underway that are good for chickens as well in order to prevent chickens from getting sick. And hopefully this is a way we can prevent using so many antibiotics in chicken populations is using uh, something like this, a probiotic, to treat them ahead of time. So. Uh, they can prevent the bad bacteria from arriving. Uh, this is just a scan that maybe didn't show up as well, but some of the bacteria, actually some of the syndromes or conditions have been treated by lactobacillus species. Again, a variety of species are represented here. These are all abbreviation, but rheumatoid arthritis, obesity, type 2, uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, cancer, um, and um, Inflammatory bowel disease and HIV have all had, um, not the disease itself is not cured, but have had symptoms that have been treated by lactobacillus. So uh, kind of a wide range of examples in which this good bacteria has been used to treat people and hopefully prevent some disease in, in the process. Uh, it's also this bacteria, again, that shows up in a lot of probiotics. I'm going to talk about that briefly. So can we cultivate or enhance our micro microbiome, and that's actually where some of this comes into play. And personally, um, you know, as it's been intriguing to me as some of this has developed, I, I guess I could say I'm a believer, but I'm a skeptical believer because I'm a scientist and I always have to find the evidence for, you know, whether this is going to work or not. Most evidence I have is anecdotal, uh, but I've had a dog that has been treated with antibiotics and it seemed to respond very well. Um, as a parent, we always gave our kids yogurt if they were on antibiotics, and they seem, they seem to respond well. Uh, teaching microbiology actually has been an eye-opening experience. So I've learned a lot about some of these interactions and some of the possibilities that perhaps um, the probiotics can, can uh, address in the process. But at the same time, there's lots of unsubstantiated claims, and so that's where we have to be careful. So, if you want to you know, venture into this area, I'm sure many of you have in different ways because you eat yogurt or other things, it's good to understand of what the range of possibilities here. So there are probiotics, prebiotics, and a combination of the two, which I'll just mention right now, are symbiotics, which are probiotics and prebiotics together. So probiotics are actually a preparation or a food product that contains live organisms that can give some health benefit. 
And examples of these are over here. So yogurt would be the best example, but there's a multitude of other, whoops, I guess I hit a button there. There we go. Uh, that have possibility of providing uh, microbiome. There must be a loose connection there. I'm not sure what's happening. There we go. Maybe we'll catch a glimpse of it. Uh, the prebiotics are not by are not live organisms themselves, but they are food for the microbiome. So uh, food that can help the microbiome grow better. So provide some benefit. And I think it might be a projector, but I'm not sure. So uh, when it comes to probiotics, there are lots of claims out there. Uh, there are lots of substances that are sold. It turns out that most of these, I think as far as I understand, are not FDA approved. In fact, I tried to find a list of FDA products and I could not find them. I uh, didn't find any FDA approved products, in fact. And they're sold as supplements, just like other supplements you buy as far as vitamins or other types of things. So uh, again, um, we have lots of anecdotal evidence, but the actual scientific clinical trials are few and far between. In fact, many of these clinical trials have not been successful. And I think it has to do with trying to treat the microbiome with a single organism rather than maybe more complex um, population of different microbiome population. So uh, there has been recently a very successful clinical trial. And I apologize for this, but I'll try to continue. Uh, it was announced actually in August of this year, a clinical trial that took place in India. It was one of the few that has really been a huge success. So this scientist, he's actually at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, he did this clinical trial in India, and one of the things they were looking for was some way in which infant sepsis could be treated. So infant sepsis is a problem in certain parts of the world more than others. What they did is they used a lactobacillus species, again, from the same family. Uh, they added to it a prebiotic, uh, fructooligosaccharide. And uh, what they found was that there was a 40% reduction in uh, infant sepsis compared to uh, those that were treated by a placebo. So great uh, effort and great direction and possibly, and hopefully more to come. As, as we have the ability to select for specific examples. So what you may or may not see at the bottom is that he did additional clinical trials before this using kind of uh, over-the-counter market available uh, probiotics, yogurts, and that sort of thing, and those were not successful in treating uh, infant sepsis in the past. What he did was select for a specific train that adhered to the gut more specifically. So it turns out many of our probiotics, so the examples we have in yogurt, Many of those actually do not reside in the gut for very long. We eat them, they are there for a short period of time, and they leave. Whereas in this case, he was able to select for a specific strain that adhered and would stay for weeks, if not months at a time, and that way colonize the gut and hopefully help. And it did show to a happy improvement as far as this one uh, specific type of, of disease. So I'm just about ready to wrap up and we can get through this. So one way to look at this again is by community ecology. And one aspect that I think deserves just a final note is that what we see as a theme is diversity matters. And in this case, diversity in terms of number of species. So when you talk about ecology and, and diversity, richness is important. So the number of species, number of taxa, and also evenness. So not just one dominant species and a few examples of others, but more a broad spectrum. And from the evidence from a number of different studies, it appears that diversity with the microbiome, especially when it has to do with human health, is very important. And that gives some redundancy. So even if one microbe dies off, you have in that diversity other organisms that kind of, kind of follow the same example or kind of take up the same role. So this is the Christian discourses in science and math, and I want to mention one thing at the end here. So how does this relate to God's creation? And I think one good example is that God has designed us to be in community. And usually we talk about that in a scriptural sense as far as community with other believers, and that is true, but this gives us kind of a microcosm and a, I think a great object lesson of what 
God designed us to be both as individuals in a spiritual way, but also interacting with other organisms as well. Something we had no idea about even you know a few decades ago. So uh, in the biblical sense, uh, I, actually a couple weeks ago, I go to CCF and the pastor there, Pat Callahan, give a shout out to him. He had part of the sermon was talking about community. And he, his points, he said, community provides strength and safety. And I'll read it here. Community <laughs> provides support. We are better together than separate. We are grow best in community. And I went down that list and I checked off each one. That's true for the microbiome. That's true for the microbiome, which is kind of cool. See how God creates and coordinates real life lessons, even in the microbiology that we can study. So I just had a summary slide, but maybe too much to try to go through that. But microbes are everywhere. It's kind of the take home lesson. There are many habitats where they occur. There's high diversity in our human body. And really, we do have an opportunity perhaps to enhance that. That science is not clear as far as how much we can change our microbiome. We can to some degree. Uh, but I think it's going to be exciting going forward because I think there are going to be many uh, new discoveries to come in ways that we can enable our microbiome and help enable and prevent disease in the process. So with that, and with our blinking lights, I think I'm going to go ahead and end and see if there are any questions. All right, so um, if you have a question, if you'll raise your hand, I'll, I'll bring the mic to you so everyone can hear your question. Okay. Some health books suggest that the right there. Some health books suggest that blood type goes with an acceptable diet for a person. Do you think there's any relationship between blood type and gut biome? Um, I don't know of a specific instance that I've read as far as research paper. Um, so you're talking about a B blood type, O blood type, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I don't know any evidence of that, but it wouldn't be surprising if you look at the science literature, just like any other two combinations of human health, you'll probably find something that could have one impact on the other. So, yeah, uh, not specifically, but undoubtedly somebody has looked at some aspect of that. Yeah. And I'll be around afterwards if anybody wants to come up and ask a question. That would be great as well. Okay. All right. Well, as Dr. Funk said, he's going to be around. If you have some questions that you'd like to ask him, you can come up and do that. But let's give Dr. Funk one more round of applause. Thank you.